Okay, so we were talking about what's going on in Kansas. That's an issue we're going to return to a little bit, you know, just a little bit later. Um, it's going to kind of come back up again throughout the 1850s, but we need to do a little bit of a departure here because there's a major, uh, huge, wide-sweeping political change in the United States that we need to address in this time period, um, and that is the rise of the Republican Party. Um, now, the fallout of the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the ensuing controversy over the removal of the 3630 line from the old Missouri Compromise had driven the Whig Party uh, to pretty much the brink of collapse and, and, and they're off the national stage. Uh, and it had split uh, a lot of Northern Democrats away from the Democratic Party. And they all start to join up. When you get the, these parties breaking down, they join into what are known as free soiler parties, something we've alluded to in the past. But these groups are all about removing Ameri uh, slavery from American society. And dozens of these groups start to emerge in the mid-1850s. Um, and they're coming up under names like the Anti-Nebraska Party, going after the Kansas-Nebraska Act, or the People's Party. They all got a lot of different names. But the common name under which they start to coalesce, under which they start to come together and identify themselves, is as Republicans. Um, despite their various monikers, these groups all shared a common belief that it was their duty to stop the expansion of Southern slavery westward in American society. They would make no further concessions after the Kansas-Nebraska Act. That's their main platform. Slavery doesn't move another inch to the west. Um, and they would vehemently dedicate themselves to abolishing the institution of slavery across the United States. As they start to become a more powerful and dominant group, any of the lingering pro-slavery Whigs have shifted to the Democratic Party. Um, now, any of the uh, sort of pro-lingering Northern Democrats around, they are going to start to shift over into the Republican Party, although they will sort of, there will be an existing Northern Democratic Party all the way through the Civil War and afterwards. Uh, but, in 1854, during the midterm elections, Northern Democrats lost control of the House and all but two of the free state legislatures. When all of this comes together, what you're seeing is that the Democrats are becoming firmly the party of slavery and the party of the South, and the Republicans are going to step up and become the party of anti-slavery in the North. Um, so, because of these events that are going on in the middle of the 19th century, this gives us our two major political parties that we still work with today, the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, and so the reason that I introduced that idea where I did is because they, you now have these two diametrically opposed groups sitting in Congress, and they're having to deal with this issue of slavery. And when Kansas gets two state governments, two state legislatures, and two state constitutions, and they both apply for statehood in the Union, it's going to be put up to the federal legislature. So, the Democrats are in power in the Senate, and they naturally are going to recognize the Lecompton pro-slavery government. The Republicans are in control of the House of Representatives, and they are opting to recognize the Lawrence-based anti-slavery government. Um, so, in the midst of all of this argument going on over which Kansas government is the real Kansas government, a Massachusetts senator who we last saw in Boston challenging segregation, he's a notable abolitionist, uh, he stands up in the Senate and makes a speech called The Crime Against Kansas. Basically, basically what it is is it's a huge condemnation of the pro-slavery Southerners and their efforts to force slavery onto other areas of the country, in particular the territory of Kansas. Um, basically what he says is, slave owners in the American South don't recognize justice. They don't recognize the rule of law. They send a bunch of border ruffians from Missouri over to Kansas to cheat and illegally swing the vote in their favor. Um, and so he stands up in this whole time, he's, he's pretty much just ragging on the South. Um, Two days later, a South Carolina congressman for, by the name of Preston Brooks would stand up on the Senate floor and brutally beat Sumner with his cane. Uh, he beats Sumner within an inch of his life, almost kills him, permanently disfigures him. And he says, I did it because you insulted our Southern honor. Um, now, Sumner would live through this attack, but he never fully recovers. Half of his face is paralyzed and he has to walk with a cane for the rest of his life. Um, Sumner to the north becomes a martyr-like figure. They say this is a guy who put his life on the line 
for anti-slavery ideals, for abolitionist ideals. Uh, Preston is seen uh, in the North as being this uncivilized barbarian. Um, and basically what you're seeing here is that this event is further driving the country apart, like everything else during this time period. Um, so what the Northerners are saying is that's the problem with Southern slave owners. You try to talk to them and you try to say, here's what you're doing. You're cheating, you're swinging votes. What you're doing is wrong. Holding people in slavery is wrong. If you try to have that discussion with you, there are a bunch of barbarians who beat you with a club. Uh, so you can't negotiate with them. You can't work with them. You can't reason with them. There are a bunch of animals who will just beat you if you don't like what they don't like what you say. Um, and so that's the way that the North is starting to view the South. And, and so when you look on the other hand, Southerners see, uh, see Preston Brooks, the guy who beat Sumner, um, as a hero for defending the dignity and the honor of the American South. Uh, in fact, a number of Southerners would start to send him canes with the inscription written on it, hit him again. Uh, and as you move to the next uh, slide, you can see two different representations of this event uh, by artists of the time period. The one on the left is particularly telling. This is the way that the North views this event. You see uh, Brooks setting upon Sumner, who's defending himself with a pen in his hand. In other words, I'm a legislature. I'm here to make law. I'm here to discuss issues of national importance with reason and intellect. And this is what they're saying here is Southern chivalry, argument against clubs. Um, and so when the South knows that they don't have a good argument, they'll just start beating you with a cane. That's what they're saying. The other one is, uh, and you can see in the background, there's a number of politicians sort of cheering Brooks on. Uh, the other uh, sort of interpretation by this artist is a little bit more accurate um, in terms of Sumner's not on his back with a pen in his hand. He actually just kind of gets blindsided, gets his head pressed against a podium and beat. Um, so that's the imagery you're seeing there. So... We're talk we've talked about a lot of very important things as they pertain to Kansas. And what we're just seeing here and what the whole, what you really ought to be taking away from this whole lecture is this is what our country is doing. It's just ripping in half. With every single event that plays out on the national stage, the North and South get further and further apart from negotiation, from compromise, from being able to avoid what we all know is coming, the Civil War. Um, and another major issue that's going to push this forward is the Dred Scott versus Sanford case. Um, this is where we're going to see the court, uh, the courts trying to adjudicate the issue of slavery. Obviously, arguments over it in the legislature aren't working out real well, so it's going to move to the judicial branch. On the next slide, you can see after the title slide, there's an image of uh, Dred Scott himself, the, the guy who uh, fights for his freedom in the American court system. In the middle, you have a, a, a guy named John Emerson. He is Dred Scott's slave owner, um, and he works with the U.S. military. And his work is going to carry him around to different territories, which is what will precipitate this case in 1857. On the far right, you see an image of a, the Supreme Court Justice. Uh, the That is Judge uh, Taney, uh, Judge, uh, Chief, uh, I got to get his title right here, uh, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney. He's the one who's going to hand down the decision in the Dred Scott case. Um, now, a guy, uh, the president of the United States at this time is uh, James Buchanan. He's just before he's sworn in in 1857. The Supreme Court, which at this time was dominated by pro slavery Southern judges, made an extremely controversial ruling in the Dred Scott versus Sanford case. Uh, Dred Scott was a slave of an army surgeon by the name of John Emerson, that guy we saw on the last slide. Emerson's work had taken him out of his home state of Missouri and up into the free states of Illinois and Wisconsin. And during that time, he takes uh, Dred Scott along with him. And Dred Scott is traveling around, and then they return to the slaveholding state of Missouri. Once he's back in, his, in Missouri, Dred Scott sues for his freedom. He goes, the time I spent up in those free territories like Illinois and Wisconsin, I should have been granted my freedom when I was up there. So he sues for his freedom and argues under the law that he should be made a free man. Now, this goes all the way through the court systems from the local level at Sanford Courthouse all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is dominated by pro-slavery advocates. And they sit back and they listen to this case. The ruling they make is 
absolutely a bombshell on the national level. This is a huge, huge, huge occurrence. In their ruling, they don't just say, Dred Scott, your time in Illinois and Wisconsin doesn't make you a free man by American law. They go further than that. They go, well, actually, we never should have been listening to this case in the first place because African Americans can never be citizens in the United States. As non-citizens, they don't have a right to bring up lawsuits in the U.S. Um, and so what they're doing here is they're saying, not just we're not just making a decision on Dred Scott. We're making a decision that no African American people can have any citizenship rights in the United States. That's the decision that they make in the Dred Scott case. They don't just stop there. They take their ruling a step further. They go, Congress... Furthermore, has no right to make any decisions on what territories can do uh, when they make decisions over slavery. Um, and so what they're ultimately doing is they're taking the issue of slavery out of the legislature's hands. They're saying, we're making these decisions as the judicial branch, and the territories out west are going to get overrun by slaveholders, and then they will make their decision on whether or not they want slavery. This is seen as an incredible travesty of justice in the North. Uh, and the South looks at the Dred Scott case as one of the biggest victories they've scored throughout this time period. Um, now, Kansas, as a result of the Dred Scott case, erupts into chaos again. Uh, and both the pro- and anti-slavery governments there put forward state constitutions. Congress still cannot agree on which one they are going to recognize. And so, ultimately, Kansas is going to remain a territory until the Civil War. Uh, when they will enter the Union as a free state and throw their support behind the Union when the, the nation splits in half. Um, and so this Dred Scott case has this impact of uh, violence erupts again in Kansas after it had kind of settled down for a few years between 1854 and 1857. So, Ultimately, the last issue we're going to be dealing with in this week's lecture slides are the emergence of a, another political party known as the Know Nothings in their time period and the issue of immigration. Uh, immigration is still very much a hot button issue in the United States at this time period. Uh, and the Republican Party is growing out of this desire to stop slavery, uh, but they are not the only emerging political party of the mid 1850s. Slavery is definitely the issue that touches everybody. It's the most important issue to everybody. But immigrants are still flooding in by the hundreds of thousands to the United States, mostly to the East Coast cities, as we saw a few weeks back in our lectures. Um, and they're increasingly being viewed as a serious threat to the sovereignty and well-being and the American way of life in northern cities. Um, the immigrant, immigrants, as we talked about, are being driven to the U.S. from Europe by a number of factors. Number one, there's a lot of job opportunities in the industrializing north. Population growth in Europe has put a lot of stress on their uh, societies there and created terrible living conditions. And then finally, there's, being, uh, there's a number of crop failures occurring across Europe that's driving people uh, to leave Europe and for various reasons and come over to the United States. Um, so, we've already talked about a lot of this, but most of the immigrants are German or Irish. Uh, the vast handful being Irish, and then the, uh, a number of others are coming from Britain still. They're coming from Western or Northern European nations. There's a handful of Scandinavian immigrants moving in at this time, coming from Sweden and Denmark. Um, now, the vast majority of these farmers are of little, uh, they have very little education, they have very little money. Um, and they're largely seen as undesirables in their home country, and Ameri a lot of Americans view them in that same light. They say, look, we're just getting the people that Ireland didn't want, that Germany didn't want. They're sending all their undesirables over to the U.S. Um, and so you see with this surge of European immigrants, uh, it's really also becoming very troubling for Protestant Americans because of their Catholic identity. Um, and so this is all part of what we call the great wave of immigration in the 19th century. Um, and as we've discussed already, most of them are settling in the north and east coast. Um, so the reaction to these immigrants in this immigration wave um, is the Know Nothing Party and a concept known as nativism. Um, so 
basically, while a lot of people are, are looking at this issue of slavery as being the biggest one of the time period, uh, you're going to see that nativism starts to grow. And nativism definitionally is a belief that America is a land for Protestant white Anglo-Saxons, people from English-speaking countries or Germanic-speaking countries. But for the most part, they're narrowing it during this time period. Uh, they're really looking at Protestant whites from English-speaking countries. They understood the rush of immigration into the United States at this time period uh, to be a major threat to the political, social, and economic well-being of the United States. Uh, this drove nativists into near hysteria. Protestants had always been leery of Catholics because they answered to the Pope, not to the national authority. In 1854, something known as the American Party will emerge. They're also known as the Know Nothing Party. They formed together out of a group of secret societies that had anti-immigrant leanings and nativist tendencies. They started to grow in the American cities in the north around the 1840s. Uh, but because they met in secret groups, uh, ultimately what would happen if you were to ask one of them about the American Party, you'd say, hey, what's this American Party all about? They'd go, ah, I don't know anything. So they become more popularly known under this label of know-nothings. Um, and they're going to emerge right around the same time as the Republican Party. Um, and this is what, and what they're doing is they're saying, look, here's the problem. Both Republicans and Democrats are corrupt. Democrats are trying to get you to buy into slavery. Republicans are trying to get you to fight for abolition. And they're both losing sight of the real problem. The real problem are immigrants. Um, and so they start trying to pass legislation. They say, we're all too focused on slavery. We need to focus on this problem of immigration. They start passing legislation that restricts only, uh, office to only native-born citizens. Uh, they're going to bar funds for parochial schools that are meant to help immigrant children adapt to American society. And they push the process for naturalization for American citizenship from five years to 21 years. These are the things they're able to accomplish in the legislature. Um, now, the Democrats are becoming increasingly associated with the immigrant class. Um, and this will allow the know-nothings to make some stunning political gains in the North, uh, where the Democrats already are sort of struggling. Um, now, they are going to take over state government in Delaware, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts in 1854. They make major gains in the state legislatures in New York, Maryland, California, and Kentucky in 1855. Um, so, the major question facing America in the mid-1850s is, there's two emerging political parties, the Republicans, who are all about ending slavery, and the know-nothings, who are all about ending immigration to the United States. Which one is going to win out and replace the defunct Whig Party? Uh, now, ultimately, what we see happening here is that the Republicans, as you know, are going to win out. Because slavery is a national problem. When you look at those states where the know-nothings make gains, they're mostly states with big immigrant populations. But if you're not in a state with a big immigrant population, then you don't really care what the anti-immigrant people are talking about. Um, and so the know-nothings aren't able to get national traction. They stay sort of at the state level, and the Republicans will become that new dominant party to oppose the Southern Democrats. Um, now, anti-immigrants, and just because the know-nothings aren't really going to survive as a viable political party, doesn't mean that nativist sentiments go away. Um, really what's happening here is that this is something that will continue all throughout the 19th century, and most people, I think, would reasonably argue that there are still nativist tendencies in the United States today. Whenever we get large numbers of immigration, there's a pushback to that immigrant group. They start vilifying that group. Um, and so if you go through the rest of the slides here, uh, taking a look at the imagery there, what you see is their depiction of Irish and German people. And this is how they're, they're sort of depicting this problem with immigration. You have uh, a German guy running in a lager beer barrel and an Irish guy chasing him with a club, uh, what they call a shillelagh in Irish culture. It's a club. Uh, and he's wearing a, a, a jug there or a barrel that says Irish whiskey. So this is depicting them all as drunks. When you go to the next picture, you can see an image of uh, an Irish immigrant there. He's sitting on uh, Uncle Sam's gunpowder, and he's got a lit torch, and he's waving a bottle of whiskey around in the air. 
And so what you're seeing there is really this image of the Irish as being this very dangerous. They're about to blow the country up. There are a bunch of uh, bad drunks that we can't really trust to be good American citizens. Uh, and then on the far right, there's an image uh, of a boat, and it's got the title, The Poor House from Galway. Galway is a major port of departure for Irish people coming over to the United States in this time period. Um, and so what they're saying here is basically what Ireland is doing, and, and by extension, they're talking about all of Europe. They're putting their poor people on boats, the people they don't want to deal with, and they're sending them over to us to make them our problem. And so this is the kind of rhetoric, nativist rhetoric, that stays in America, American populations um, for the long haul. And so, again, I always remind people, I hear people, uh, when they talk about what we deal with today with immigration and anti-immigrant tendencies, they go, well, immigration's always been a part of the United States. I don't know why people are getting all bent out of shape. But if you're looking solely at history, America has a very poor track record of integrating immigrants into American society. During this time period, they hate the Germans and the Irish. You move a little further into the 19th, early 20th century, it's the Eastern and Central Europeans, the Italians. They hate them as well. And there's nativist tendencies against them. On the West Coast, the Chinese and other Asian groups like Japanese are hated out there. They face nativism. In modern times, we see the same thing towards Latin American migrants moving up. And so it's important to understand that this has a long tradition in American history. We've always been a country of immigrants, but we have never successfully uh, squashed out this idea of nativism. You still have that anti-immigrant pushback there. So the last thing I'll say to wrap up this week's lecture videos is I didn't talk about John Brown's raid. It's something I'll address when, when we come up uh, with next week's lecture videos, which actually that'll be week 15's lecture videos. Uh, we'll be looking at it then. But you're going to be reading about it in your book, and you should just get the general outline of it. Basically, John Brown, that guy who led the raid uh, for the pro uh, anti-slavery advocates uh, in Pottawatomie Creek, He's going to lead a raid on Harper's Ferry, Virginia. Uh, ultimately, he's going to uh, fail in his raid, and he'll be killed by the U.S. Marines there. Uh, or he'll, He's captured by the U.S. Marines, forced out of hiding, um, and they're going to execute him. But he will become a signal for the abolitionist cause of the North. You're reading about that, that this week in your textbook, so just make sure you pay careful attention to that. As usual, if you have any questions, concerns, feel free to shoot me an email. Bye-bye.